Yeah, uh, Aisha, welcome to Big Conversations. Is it Asia or Aisha? Asia. Asia. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, but it's like Muslim name, right? Sure. No, I see, I see. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've been uh, looking forward to, to this conversation. Uh, so I'm going to just say a brief intro and then you can like complete it with uh, sort of the, your full profile. Sure. Uh, what I know is you're a practicing lawyer and uh, part of your specialty is uh, family law, sure. especially, you know, supporting men. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you tell us a little bit more. What exactly? Uh, what, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I must say I'm glad to be here. Uh, as earlier introduced, my name is Asia Tusi Mechiribeda. I am a lawyer, an advocate of the High Court. I'm practicing with Nabukenya Mulalira and Company Advocates there at Nkroma Road. Um, we, we practice law in different fields, uh, amongst which is family law and practice. And uh, we've had quite a number of cases and domestic related ranging from marriages, divorce, mm. children, mm. succession. Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, let's uh, start from this family law thing. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine, I think a mutual friend, uh, Deo, <laughs> who, yes. uh, yeah, who recommended that uh, you come to the podcast, sure. was very keen to even show me a Kanye West clip a clip where Kanye West was denied to see the daughter's birthday, right? And part of this, okay, so part of the conversation is that uh, legally, the law may not be extremely fair to men in terms of, you know, access to, say, children, you know, after divorce, basically, the law seems like it is designed intentionally to be unfair to men. Is that what you think as well? Well, it, in, in, in my own perspective, it is not per se unfair to men, mm -hmm. um, but it is dependent on the circumstances of each case. Um, so that is why you find that maybe men feel that they are, that law is not necessarily in their favor. Of course, after divorce, uh, for the case of the children, many times it is dependent on the age of the child, the sex of the child, but most importantly, it is the welfare of the child. The law looks, as, looks at the paramount welfare of the child. And when it looks at the paramount welfare of the child, we are looking at the health care, we are looking at education, we are looking at feeding, and any other aspect that is affiliated to the child's welfare. Uh, where the child, for example, is a, is a minor, a, a, a toddler, yeah? Mm -hmm. there, there, there are cases where we've had uh, the babies only, say, for example, still a month's baby, or even two months or three months, yeah? And uh, the, the man is, the husband is demanding custody of the child. Mm -hmm. But under such circumstances, this Unrest, is a child that yeah. needs to be breastfed. This is a child that needs the mother, tender love. And in such circumstances, we shall not look at what the two parties are facing as a conflict, mm -hmm. but the law looks at the welfare of, of the this child. child. Unless under certain circumstances, for example, the mother is not a fit and proper person to ensure that this child has a proper welfare then under such circumstances, custody can be given to the father, but of course, uh, cons putting under certain considerations to ensure that still the child's welfare is paramount. Um, then where a child, for example, is a teenager, school going, and all that. Uh, when we look at welfare, there, there are parties that separate, that divorce, and each of the couples goes their separate ways. One gets married and the other also gets married. But the children have, as a parent, you still have parental responsibility. Yeah. It does not, you divorcing does not take away the fact that you are the parent of a particular child A or Z. So irrespective of where the child is staying, there could be joint custody. As, as a father, you might have a right, you might have maintenance orders that may have been imposed upon you, it could be joint maintenance mm -hmm. that both mother and father contribute it's a certain a amount, fees, amount yeah. to either school fees, mm -hmm. medication. So you share costs and obligations. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we'll have two questions actually that uh, have been tricky to me. So when I watch the movies, right, <laughs> most people who divorce, 
uh, there's uh, movies and rap music. The father has a sort of this burden uh, called child support. Yeah, it is very rare. I don't know if I've actually heard of it where the mother has that burden as well, right? And I want to understand within Ugandan law scope, you know, do we also share, the, is that also uh, applicable? Is that what you've been explaining, for example? Uh, well, child support, that is what I would take as maintenance, mm -hmm. yeah, for the child. Uh, like I earlier said, the, the constitution provides for a right of parentage. Now, when we're going to other specific laws, that when we look at parentage, we're looking at parental responsibility. Mm -hmm. When we're still going to parental responsibilities, what are the roles of the father? What are the roles of the mother? Ideally, in, in, in our local or traditional context, it is the father that has that fundamental major role of ensuring that the child goes to school, basically the general child support. Yeah? So in as much as you might look at it on one angle, we also have families, for example, where the wife or the divorced wife in this case is a, is a, is a, is a working lady, mm -hmm. yeah? And she has ability to support this child. Yeah. But that does not necessarily take away the responsibility of the father. It, it, is, it can be joint support. But as the father, to meet up to your parental responsibility, that is, that is prescribed under the law, and you have to actually perform it. Is there a situation where I can, uh, what's the word? Uh, say, for example, uh, when, you're, when you go on a website, uh, they tell you that uh, clicking this button means you agree that we can track you, right? Is there a situation in the law, for example, where I can say, I don't want to be this kid's father anymore? <laughs> is, that, uh, is that room available? Uh well, it is, pa 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 in Uganda, we have different, I, I don't want to use the word modes of being a parent, no, because mm -hmm. we have a child by birth, mm -hmm. we have children that are adopted, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. Um, let me use this, it's an adopted child as also, and also a biological child. Biological, yes. uh, when I go into the biological child, by law, there are no options. There yeah. Is no, yeah. You're this. You're this child parent, and mm -hmm. you have to meet up to your responsibility. And if there is need to compel you through court orders to meet such responsibility, then the law shall take I its see, course. Because there, in such circumstances, for example, uh, the mother can go and petition court for an order of maintenance. There are procedures for that, mm -hmm. and then she'll go on and swear affidavits. Uh, prove that you're actually the biological father of this child. Since this child was born, you have not said done A, B, C, D, E, and F. So otherwise, every father would at one point say there is that law that says I no longer want to be. See, <laughs> this see, you get? Yeah. So the, uh, the, that is why that is not possible to us at a particular extent. Actually, it is not. Yeah. However, mm -hmm. if we go to the adoptive child, you see, with a child, I'll now give, let me try to delve into even our cultural aspects. M men tend to fear the parental responsibilities that I'm talking about. And even if you come and say that, oh, I wish there was some law that stops maybe a man if I don't want to be your father, mm -hmm. to, to put that on table. Now, being a child to someone creates certain rights to that child and even to you as a parent. Yeah, it does not just stop at childbirth and all. Say, for example, uh, at the point of death of the parents, yeah, things to do with inheritance, mm. who is entitled, even on that part of the child, if it is the child, as a parent, probably, actually not probably, as a parent, you're one of the people, you're one of the beneficiaries in the event. You may not be a first because the beneficiaries are categorized into first, second, and so on and so forth. So that is why we see tendencies of men who could have abandoned their children, but at a point when they, 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 they want to, there is that good role of a parent, yeah? yeah. In courts, yeah. you're claiming the right way it deems 
fit. Yeah. Yet your primary role is something that you, you, you let go from the very start. So it same applies to an adoptive child. When, for example, you're the biological father, uh, let us look at maybe children in maybe in, 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 in children homes, maybe like Sanyo Baby's home or orphanages or, you know. If when that child is adopted under the law, that child gets the same rights as an adopt as, as a biological child. I see, I see. Yeah. And that child has a right to inherit your property. That child has the same right just like your biological children. And in such circumstances, many times the adoptive parent is paramount than than the biological, than the biological see, parent. See, see. Because now the adoptive parent has taken up the full responsibility, the full parental responsibility. Mm. Where the parent is, is gone, then it's, 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 it is strictly the adoptive parent. But where the, the biological parent is there, then there is no way you will come up. Of course, sometimes there are those mutual agreements, but there are particular instances where by law, you're, you're yeah. detached. I see. Yes. So, yeah, okay, so there's another way to look at. Okay, there's another version of this story that can be also very interesting, right? Say we divorce me and my wife, uh, and then I have to pay child support for my child. So I pay child support, but for say, if we divorce when the child is, say, three years, I pay child support for 15 years, for example. Uh, maintenance, what you call maintenance, right? And at 18, I find out that the child is actually not mine. <laughs> These are lyrics from a Kanye West song. Mm. But so, you know, in a scenario like that, am I entitled to sue to get back that kind of child support? Is there like room in the law where I am entitled to that money back if I find <laughs> out later that I was tricked? Well, you can, yeah. Many, many, many cases that come up relating to paternity, and I, I was actually watching news either earlier this week or even last week. It was a there was a similar kind of scenario where two men went in for a DNA, and then the man that actually all along thought he was the biological father is not, and he has been educating this child. Yeah. He has been supporting this child, and even after the DNA results came out not in his favor, he insisted that the child is his. <laughs> no matter what and he wanted to actually go ahead and look after this child uh, but the law is the law where it has been declared that person X is the father and you're not the father then he is and he's not supposed to take up responsibility however that does not deter you as a person who wants to do it to take up that responsibility regarding the question that you have asked yes it, it that can be at your own Right there, yeah. um, it is something you can decide to do considering everything else that you have put in yeah either uh, I'm, I'm trying to look at different offenses that because this can be um, can be a criminal offense yeah okay. <laughs> uh, I I would want to categorize it under obtaining money by false pretense uh, mm -hmm. because many some women tend to to use it as a mechanism they use children I see, I see, yeah, yeah? yeah, yeah, yeah. To, 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 to get money from men and they know if, if, if I decide to tell this guy that he's the father, then he'll look after this person, he will look after me as a person. So, of course, those charges can come up and you have a right to sue for as long as you feel you have a cause of action and a right mm -hmm. of claim. And this person can be able to compensate you no, I see, uh, I see. for the monies that you have I see, I see. if you decide to take that route but of course, and in this case this person is the mother not the child you can't see the actual child no you can can't you? but the child wasn't even there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. neither did they ever sit down with the mother and plan yeah, that you know what this man is going to be your father <laughs> see, unless those that come along the way when the child has actually grown mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I, see, I see i see mm -hmm. okay so now back to to the conversation you know it's uh if you look at the numbers, right, it's not very common. And, you know, except for extraordinary circumstances that the mother is denied custody, you know, it would be either a shared custody or the mother. Okay, well, there are cases where the father gets custody. But if you look at uh, most of the numbers, unfortunately, I couldn't have, I didn't have access to like the local numbers here in Uganda. But the numbers that I've looked at for people who publish such data, say in the United States, it's not, it's a... Uh, yeah, the curve tilts in a scenario where the mother doesn't get custody at all. Those are very low. I think they're less than thirty percent. 
uh, yeah, so I'm wondering again. That that's part of the question that I asked. You know, I'm wondering, uh, is this intentional? Is the law intentionally designed to let the child grow with the mother, or do you think this is something that can be revised? You know, what what are your opinions on the fact that? Well, like I said, it is circumstantial. Mm. Yeah, uh, either fortunately or unfortunately. Maybe such circumstances may not necessarily be in favor of men. Uh, circumstances where you find a mother is not given custody. Still, I emphasize welfare of the child. You'll find that maybe this mother is staying alone. She does not have time to look after the child. Maybe she has uh, what the, the, her, her character, her lifestyle. Yeah, What kind of people does she bring at home? Are they safe for the child? Mm -hmm. That when the mother is not around, with who, which person is this person with? Is with is the child with? Yeah. Uh, so on the side of the mother, circumstances when custody can be denied is dependent on those and um, those situations that really are not so paramount to the welfare of the child same applies to men but naturally in our societies it is mothers that really have that tender motherly caring and even that first attention it's the mother that you the breastfeeding the feeding the what you as a man you will provide mm -hmm. but it is yeah. rare that you're going to actually feed yeah, change this I child see, consider uh, change diapers their health those mother instincts of oh this is happening to the child the law looks at very, very many things. For the father, for example, you have divorced. I've given you an example. You, say, for example, you get married to some other mm -hmm. woman. Mm -hmm. It is okay. What the law tends to look at, are you a responsible person? Are you a responsible father? If you've gotten married to any other woman, is, is she able to perform that motherly role to this child? without any kind of discrimination, yeah? Because mm -hmm. when, when, when you're a father and you're asking for custody, you have to show a picture or an impression that this child shall have a good home, a comfortable home with parental love without any kind of discrimination. You may not be necessarily married, but the people that you live with as a man are able to look after this child as though it was theirs. I see, I see. Okay. So yeah, uh, so the, the question also is in a scenario where say my in-laws, say, you know, God forbid, uh, I lose my wife and then my in-laws, you know, I've, I've had a scenario like that where my in-laws sort of uh, try to take custody of the child. What are the scenarios where that can be acceptable in court? Mm. Of course, the parent takes first priority mm -hmm. as, as, a, as, as the father of the child. Of course, when you talk about, I'm looking at an aspect where it's the wife that has died, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? And the, 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 the husband is still alive. The law provides first priority for mm -hmm. the father, yeah? But of course, I, like I have earlier stated, circumstances, you have to prove that indeed, more so where you, if the family, for example, petitions court for custody of this child, uh, they have to prove, for example, that you are in no state to, take to take this child. So they look at more of the negatives. <laughs> mm, I see, I see. Maybe it may, it may not be a negative. There is a case that one time I was handling, and uh, the, the, the gentleman, in this instant case, the the the, the 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 wife was not dead but the 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 man wanted custody of the child but the mother worked abroad yes mm -hmm. the man the the husband the, the father was here but his job as well required movements yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so he was equally not available and uh, so the child was with the mother of the was with the mother of the man. So the lady decides to come back, and when she comes back, she wants her child to be like an intermittent coming back. She wants the child to be with her mother, 
as opposed to the father who is mm. present so the because the yes the, the yeah. grandmother on the side of the mother yeah, yeah. as opposed to in as much as the father is available mm. his nature of work does not permit him yeah. to, to you know to, to take care available. to be available yeah. and take care of this child mm. Mm. so if in such circumstances maybe I, i want you to relate it to your situation yeah, yeah. in such circumstances where a court deems it fit that Okay, instead of this child being under custody of the father, let the child be under custody of the grandmother, considering that there is no availability because this man would go and leave the child with a maid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so I think that makes sense. Uh, I want you to first also clarify for me a few of these terms. So uh, I know there is a term called guardianship, right, where I become someone's guardian. Mm -hmm. There is uh, adopting. I think you hinted on that a yes. little bit. And then there is fostering, right? I don't know if we have fostering in Uganda. Yeah. So yeah, those three terms. I want you to first differentiate them for me. Adoption, guardianship, and, and fostering. fostering. Yes. Well, with adoption, uh, the 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 parent, the adoptive parent, uh, you petition court to adopt a particular child, a, with intention that this child is. For eternity, you want this child to be your, your own child, child more like a biological child. Like I earlier told you, their rights are just the same as a, a biological child, and there is no distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, when you look at a, a definition of a child, it is either a biological child or an adoptive, adoptive child. Mm -hmm. So that is with adoption, and it goes through certain phases because it is something where the child is, their life is going to change this child is entering into a, a totally different family i see i see okay yeah? yeah and in all these circumstances whichever whatever you might be applying for welfare of this child they will have to check on your capacity mm -hmm. of being able to maintain this child educate this child what what is your intention what is your motive of why do you want to adopt a child is it because you don't have children of your own is it because you, if you have children of your own they actually have to consent oh okay because this child is going to it may not be an express consent but under adoption proceedings for example in court all these children are are examined yeah by court because this is a child that is going to stay with them mm. this child is going to be their sibling mm. so the court has to examine them to know if they are indeed receptive of having a brother or a sister i see i see because in the in the event that they are not then court will not find it fit for this child to grow up in such an environment i see i see Okay so that's uh, so, so that's adoption. Yes. So when we go to fostering, fostering is periodical. It's more it's more like part of before we get into adoption, mm. there is that period of time where this child is given to you to stay with Temporal. and then yeah. temporarily. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. So that you monitor this child, understand this child, is there something that this child does that you do not want? yeah that you're not able to actually live with this child that if you had an adoptive mindset you're like mm, ah. I, see, i see so you can start as a foster parent yes you start as a later. foster parent oh i see i see yeah okay. so that the child can also relate the child because maybe for you you might be comfortable with it but the child now mm -mm. Yeah, yeah yeah i see i see yeah, this and and this happens yeah the child doesn't <laughs> want yeah i see i see yeah. so it creates fostering creates that environment of the child being familiar with the place the parents bondage the bondage of parental love and the new family that this child is going to have that is fostering yeah and uh, being someone's guardian what does that mean now guardianship um is is also a temporary kind of uh, mm. thing it depends sometimes it can be a lifetime now with a guardian uh say for example this child has parents that have passed on uh, i'll try to draw particular yeah. situations yeah. Yeah. say for example this child's parents have passed on and um 
this past this child needs a, a guardian figure yeah i'll give you an example if it's my ch if it's a child of my sister mm, mm, I see, I see. that has passed on uh, legally tradi traditionally if i take up this child now to look taking up the parental responsibility yeah. uh it's like I'm the guardian. I see, I see. But under the law, you have to apply for guardianship. You're not actually... Mm. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see, I see what you meant. A guardian. And you have to petition court. It's an application. that, you, And you give that entire background. So it is you that has full paramount responsibility for this child in whatever that happens. Mm. Whether legal-related, if... Um, uh, if you're claiming, for example, for property for this child whose parent mm. is deceased, you can come up as a legal guardian. Even your name can be registered on a title as a guardian yeah. for this child. I see, I see. Yeah, And you can transact. But for you to apply for guardianship, whatever you're applying for in terms of guardianship should be, it is the welfare of the child. Why are you yeah. coming up to apply for guardianship? What is your intention? Mm, I see, I see. I can't, uh, if my brother had like a, a Range Rover, uh -huh. I can't use that as an excuse. <laughs> okay, so, so also the thing that I don't understand, right? Mm. So the guardian is basically a parent legally. Yeah, right? the guardian is a parent, mm. yeah? The guardian is a parent and this guardian extends to particular, you know, in Uganda, a child does not have a, a right to do certain things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even signing to go for a trip in school, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this guardian is the parent figure. Yeah. Yeah. This guardian is the parent figure. This guardian is the one who can come up and apply for particular some legal prerequisites because you're you're you're, you're mandated under the law. Mm. Of course, sometimes you also now like in legal proceedings or even some other legal related we have an um uh, it's called a uh, next friend. Yes, a next friend. Okay. A next friend uh for example if it is a ch suing, a child cannot sue. So uh. a child sues through a next friend. Is it is this the same as next of kin? Uh, I wouldn't call it a next of kin see, per se, okay. but the, um, the, there is some slight there is a difference, mm -hmm. yeah. But this relates to capacity of some of the things that a child cannot do. But for guardianship, uh, like I've elaborated, mm -hmm. it is you take up parental responsibility, though you may not necessarily. There there are certain rights. For example, the first one that I gave you, you cannot inherit simply because this person is a guardian. You, you, you're being, you're mm. a guardian of a particular child. There, there are certain rights that may not accrue through guardianship as opposed to adoption. I see. And uh, does the guardianship expire when the child becomes an adult? Or can you become, can you stay? Is there any use for being a guardian for an adult? This is a know? child. So yeah, I see, I see. <laughs> when you become an adult... You don't need a guardian Yes, anymore. actually it can be... That's why I said it's something temporary. I'll give mm -hmm. an example. Still the same example that I gave, land. Yeah. Yeah? The child, uh, the moment they become 18 years, they can claim. Oh, I because see. Because now they are adults. Yeah, okay. I yeah, see. so they I no see. longer need that. So does that mean that to foster a child, you you, you have to apply for guardianship in a way? Or is not is that not a requirement to to, to, to sort of legally be a foster parent for a child? Mm. Do you also have to be their guardian? Because I, I imagine, for example, if a child says is orphaned at five years old, uh, and say you run because uh, most uh, uh, so the foster homes it sort of run as a business or an NG or something, right? And you run a foster home uh, during that time while the child transitions from being an orphan say to being uh, uh, adopted. Mm -hmm. they could stay with you, say, a year or two. Don't you have to also be a legal guardian for that child in that scenario? No, you, may, you don't have to. Oh, okay. uh, um, they are, they, for example, now like those foster homes, eh? yeah. for, for, for guardianship, you may not necessarily first be a foster, mm. yeah? 
you just need in your petition to prove some of those things oh, that oh, yeah. I have. So, so that I understand. So for the guardian, you don't have to be a foster parent first, but you the foster parent also doesn't have to be a guardian as well. Does the foster parent have to be... So I'm, I'm imagining mm. I run a foster business and I go into the villages, I get orphaned children and I bring them to this business. And what I do is I look for parents who are looking to adopt children and I match them up, right? Okay, business maybe is the wrong word. I run an NGO, I run an institution that mm. does something like that, right? Mm. I, yeah, for, for the good of the people. Mm. So if I'm doing that, during this time where I've got a child, say, from Bujiri, mm. right? And brought them to my, to a foster home, say, in uh, Kampala, mm. right? Mm. And, you know, during that time, I'm trying to find a right match. I'm finding the, a, a parent who can support this child well. And I don't have to first apply to be this child's guardian so that, you know, I can take on what you said, you know, sign the, the child's papers mm. and things like that. Yes. Okay. It is now, it is now not you necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is now the, the, the person intended, the adoptive parent, because still, even from your foster home, this child has to be fostered in this intended adoptive Mm, yeah I see, I see, I see. you may own the foster home mm. now sometimes such foster homes they are used they, they, they are those circumstances maybe child where the child under reformatory uh, circumstances of children or because i'm trying to look at it in the sense of where you're saying the business <laughs> the business in courts yeah mm. for me i was trying to look at it in that in the legal perspective, that is also yeah. legal, but in, in the process of adoption, mm. yeah, this child has to be fostered in that actual home where the adoptive I see. parents... Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I think I can miss that. So, yeah, that before you're legally an adopted parent for someone, you have, there's a, a, a temporary period where you're the foster yes, parent. you where, have to okay. be a foster okay. parent. I see that, I see yeah? that. So, Probably depending on where you're getting this mm. child from, either from a foster home direct mm. or from an, an orphanage or mm. Mm. from whichever home mm. Actually, where I you think can orphanage get. Orphanage is a good example. Yes. So, in the orphanage, while the child is in the orphanage, does the custodian of that orphanage, is the custodian of that orphanage a legal guardian to that child? Legally, there they are those processes, yeah? Mm. So, mm. They, they are more like the legal guardian. I see, I see. Yeah, they are okay. the ones that have full responsibility of this child. I see. I yeah, see. because the child is in their custody. Yeah, and they are answerable to whatever happens I see. to this child. I see. Yes. Okay, let's uh, switch a little bit. Uh, so part of, uh, so for example, you, you're Muslim, right? And uh, you're very proud of being Muslim So <laughs> because of the way you dress, right? Uh, but part of what you do, right, legally in family law means doing things that contradict Islamic law, right? For example, help women get divorced. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to understand now, you know, how do you manage to resolve this conflict as a person, you know, within yourself? Well, maybe to 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 correct you or substantiate. Yes. Of course, in Uganda we have the Mohammedan law, yeah, mm -hmm. mm, that Uganda accepts the, the the practice of the Muslim law, what you may know as Sharia law, yes. yeah, marriages act and divorce. We have that act. Now, uh, you may say it is prohibited. Well, no, in Islam, divorce is not prohibited, oh, okay. but it is not encouraged. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, yeah, I I start to be corrected. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. So in Islam, divorce is not prohibited but it is not encouraged mm -hmm. and um, that is why the process of divorce in islam is unique and its aim is targeted to see that the, the couple reconciles mm, okay. in islam or the sharia law we have a divorce that is talaq that is initiated by the husband mm. yeah where the husband would give talaq to the wife and the process of that uh, divorce, like I've said, aims so much on to reconciliation that when the when these two married people ha do have some sort of misunderstanding, they have to first go back to the elders or the imams or the sheikhs that actually uh, uh, celebrated their marriage, put their issues to them, and then at that point, the committee or those persons, particular stakeholders, have to establish what 
the problem is because by the time someone comes up and they want a divorce yeah. they have a reason as to why they want a divorce yeah. and in such circumstances they are able to advise the married couple no that is that is resolvable please do this mm -hmm. please do that okay. so in the event and after them giving you their opinion and advice you're supposed to go back to your home together the difference is maybe sleep in some other bed actually not maybe sleep in some yeah, other bedroom yeah, yeah. if you decide to sleep in the same bed there should not be any conjugal relation you oh, should see, not engage in any way um, and that is done for a period of three months what we call in islamic law the ida period okay now in the event it is rotational in the event that in the period of those three months you 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 you, you conjugate in any way then that goes back afresh by the time you go ahead and engage in two conjugal exercises, then that means there is room for reconciliation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that is how the mm. Islamic uh, the tradition that the, the, the law handles mm. divorce. Yeah. Yeah. Because it gives it a span of three months. Anything happens within that period, then there is chance of reconciliation between these people, and that is one of the months. Then there is what we call there are those circumstances you will say, eh, but sometimes that is so long a period. There are circumstances where these people cannot actually even stay mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the divorce that is initiated by the woman, Nkulu, where um, depending maybe the circumstances in which you live, maybe you're being uh, battered, mm -hmm. you cannot, at any point you will <laughs> you will end up being killed. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Or whichever circumstance in which you're living with this man that is extremely intolerable, then as a woman, you can divorce the man. You can pronounce that I have divorced you. And of course, you engage the elders, mm -hmm. but for it, it doesn't have that period, mm -hmm. the three months. Oh, period so that's uh okay so the again i'm not big on sort of islamic scholarship so <laughs> you'll forgive me where i where I, where I blunder but from the impression i get is that islam is very uh what's the right word it's not very tolerable when it comes to women's opinions and sort of women say right <laughs> but what you're saying is mm. sort of the exact opposite of what yes. i would expect yeah yes now i i you know i think people actually have a wrong perspective that islam does not uh, empower mm -hmm. yeah, women that's right word, yeah. but that is actually the contrary women are the most really? empowered people in the quran or under islamic law and um, of course it varies in different circumstances mm -hmm. um, because for us in islam we follow the hadith. The Islamic law is the hadith of the Prophet. The hadith of the Prophet, that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is his actions, his way of life. Okay. So that means how he lived with his wives, how he, ah, his, see, his, see, general, see. his general way of life. And the words that he used to say and the actions that he used to do. Now it differs a bit from Christianity. We are told to just do as they say. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Please yes. Continue. Then apart from the hadith, we also have the, the, the Quran. It's more like the constitution. It is the mm. major law. And in the Quran, we have actually a distinct surah. That is surah an nisa for women only. Okay. okay. Now, there are certain things that uh, ideally... Society may look at them as infringement on the woman's uh, right. But when you look at the racial disdendi, the reason as to mm -hmm. why that the Islam provides that law or a particular act to be done as that for the women, it is actually what justifies that the woman is being protected. Mm. I see. Oh, I want you to give me an example. I know in Saudi Arabia until recently, women weren't allowed to drive. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want you to give me an example of, of, of say, something, uh, say in the Quran, that I, because of my ignorance, I would say this is, a, this is limiting to women or because 
of again Western influence. Uh, but if you look at it from the perspective of the Islamic tradition, of, from the intention of the right of this specific law, it is doing the opposite of what I think. Well, I'll, I'll give ordinary scenarios, mm -hmm. yeah, no, without necessarily going into a particular surah and this and this. Sure. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, that are, I would I say, condemned about Islamic law, <laughs> if I, I'll even start from the dress code. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, there are those who think that this is torture for a woman. How do you dress up like that? No. Ideally and factually, it is not torture in any way. On the contrary, it is protection. Um, protection from quite a number of things. But then also it is modesty. Uh, I'll the modesty and also an act of worship. I'll start from the act of worship. Mm. Um as Muslims, you know how we conduct our prayers, yeah? We, we set ourselves, we organize ourselves, get our blues on, dress up. You have to dress up appropriately when you're going to pray to God, yeah? So cover yourself. You're not going to pray to God in a mini skirt. And then I have to yeah. bend and go and recall. So if you're... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I see. I see. Yes? Yeah. Then you have to go down, yeah? Imagine if you had simply because you have a right to put on whatever you want and then put it on, and then pray like that. However, the dress code that maybe other people would find ideal to them or a right to dress the way you want is okay. You can dress like that in your house. For the married women, actually in Islam, it is, it is uh, emphasized encouraged. or encouraged that you dress up uh, I, I don't know what term to use for that other dress code. Uh, okay. In a dress more no, in, in a more in a in a, a no, not indecent. Let's, I don't want to call it indecent, but in a, what you would term as more revealing. Okay. Yeah, because your body is your temple, true, and true. your husband is the one that has a right I see, I for see. that. I see, I see. So in the house, please don't put on <laughs> the way yeah, I'm putting see, on right now. When you're with your with, with when you're with your husband, yeah. So. That is why you see sometimes you see cases, someone is dressing up like that, they are being, you know, twisted, some girls are raped, some girls are being, you know, so to avoid all some of those things. The other issue that maybe people look at is the issue of polygamy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many of them tend to look at it as a law or a principle or a concept that is against women. But of course... <laughs> there is, in as much as there is polygamy, we, we have to look at the Quran describes circumstances under which it is supposed to occur. There are grounds, okay. there are limitations. Of course, it is absurd that, and very unfortunate, that men tend to use it n not the right way. Um, yeah, by... it is being abused mm -hmm. by many men. Mm -hmm. But if I if I if I try to to look at it in the in, in the actual way it is supposed to be in the Quran, first of all, you it is you may, it is not you must. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Yeah, okay. marry two or three or four, and of course there is a background for that. There were there were girls who were orphans. There are girls, women who are widows, and considering the jihad period and the killings that used to occur, these are women that needed care and support. So the prophet they used to encourage it so that these people have guardians to take care of them. This is an orphan, so they are taken yeah. up by. That, that, that is sort of the background of it. But still, uh, there has to be equal... I'm going to elaborate on the equality. You have to express equality, equal, equal care, equal love, affection. equal affection to all these women. Now, ideally, you cannot love people equally. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. But when we talk about that, it is in terms of provision. Yeah, that what you provide this side, you, you must be able, you must be an able man to provide right, for right. both your wives mm -hmm. or all your wives equally without any feeling like they are being sidelined. Mm -hmm. Now, you had asked me still a, a, a scenario how you see this as a protection of a woman. Say, for example, you are, you, you, you are a wife to 
a one gentleman. Women have particular complications. There are those who give birth mm -hmm. and may not necessarily heal fast. As a man, you have your own sexual urges. I see. I yeah? see, I see. There are those who take years, by the way. There are those who take with, with whichever different complication that they may have. There are, may, there are still women who have other complications, fertility complications, yeah? that maybe the woman is not able to give birth. And the man also needs children. As opposed to you having children from A to Z, A, B, C, D, <laughs> yeah. to Z, yeah. you would rather, instead of uh, committing adultery or fornicating, it's adultery actually, you would rather find another woman and get married to this woman legally, as Islam says it, and then be able to have children in the right way. I see. I see. Okay. So yeah. The, so one thing, by the way, you brought up uh, polygamy and Islam. I think, and, and I'll also pick your brain on this, right? First of all, it's uh, the Western liberal approach to marriage is the unique one, right? Uh, if you look at, say, Buganda itself, mm. uh, polygamy has been part of the tradition. If you look at the East as well, it's uh, it's sort of very, very modern. Even if you look at the West, if you look at, uh, look at, for example, the, well, I don't know if the Jewish people could be called the West, but even the, the West, yeah? Mm. Uh, if you look at the history in the Bible, the Old Testament, for example, you see, you know, Solomon. yeah, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. all these kings with all these many wives, and these are the people they've written about. That means the people they didn't write about lived very similar lives. Uh, what, 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 what has always, uh, what I've always been curious about is at what point does the world decide that you know uh, monogamy is sort of should be the predominant uh, marital thing you know <laughs> if, uh, well, islam is special because it's a religion per se right mm. so uh, even in the u.s for example as a muslim you have the right oh but after i think when you're going to apply for a u.s visa they force you to take a box that says i will not practice polygamy when i'm in the u.s that's that's a weird thing Oh, I but uh, that even. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the the what the uh even in the even in say in England right you you allowed the law is not allowed to interfere with your religion right so that's how polygamy in Islam has, has sort of existed yeah, and yeah, it <laughs> survived the one, it's it's not right? survival. <laughs> <laughs> Why though is it that all other traditions have considered uh, monogamy? Uh, so my, my assumption is, you know, like capitalism, it's probably the most stable state, right? Uh, families that are polygamous may not be as stable. That is my, my, my theory. But I'm wondering, you know, you, why, why do you think monogamy has become the de facto way to get married? Well, for me, I wouldn't call it even the de facto. <laughs> it's really? um, just like you've said, you see, uh, polygamy, first of all, is embraced first in the Muhammadan, mm -hmm. customarily. It has that customary background. You've even actually re related it to the, to the historical, you know, yeah. uh, perspective, the Solomons, all those people that we look at in the holy books. They, they were monogamous in nature, even our prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, he was? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. I, again, I don't know much about had, Islam, so you'll forgive had, me when I don't know he things. He had 11 wives, 11 wives, I would call them wives, but then, you see, the Quran kept on, the Quran came in phases, mm -hmm. up to the point when that surah was revealed for four wives. Uh, okay, yeah? okay. So, we take it that he has he had four wives, and there was, I, I wouldn't want to get into that, because yeah. it's also, yeah, yeah. but take it, he had four wives so as well. So he was polygamous. He was polygamous yeah, okay. as well. I, I thought you said he was monogamous. Okay. No. no. No, no, yeah, I get you. I he get was you. That's why I was surprised. Yes. Yes. He was polygamous okay. Okay. as well. Now, uh, for you to say that mon monogamy is the most predominant, I, I, I would not say so. But polygamy and monogamy, apart from the, 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 the cultural perspective, these are things that came with religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. the, the Christian marriages are monogamous in nature. Yeah. Yeah? And even the civil marriage. In Uganda, we have uh, yeah. about, we have the, the civil marriage, we have the, 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 the Christian marriage, 
we have the Mohammedan, we have the Hindu, we have, uh, have I talked about the customary? No, you haven't. We have the customary yeah. marriage. I see. I see. Now, each of these has its own way or principles or norms, yeah? Mm -hmm. Customary is polygamous in nature. Mohammedan is polygamous in nature. Hindu, I'm not certain. Sivo is monogamous. Oh, that's uh, I don't know if you're interested in uh, popular gossip, but uh, recently, uh, this pastor, what's his name? Pastor Bujimbo. Bujimbo, yes, yes. Uh, was sued for marrying, which was which seemed like a civil, is a custom, custom, traditional, traditional marriage. Custom marriage. Yeah. marriage. Yeah. So if you're saying, you know, legally, custom marriages are polygamous, how come he could be sued? I don't know if you're not interested in this. Well, that's fine. no, it's yeah. okay. Uh, w with the issue of Pastor Bujingo, Pastor Bujingo is is legally married to Teddy, under uh, the Christian, ah. yeah, and by 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 law, the Christian marriage is a monogamous kind of marriage. And you can't be married yes. in the Christian law and the custom married law with a different person. If f oh. that is why that is the feud, they have not yet divorced. They are still legally married. I see, I see. Okay. So, you customarily, the subsequent customary marriage is, uh, is, vo is null and void ab initio because you first conducted a monogamous marriage mm. and you can only conduct such customary marriage either only with the, <laughs> with the person with whom you have the monogamous, the monogamous yeah, yeah. marriage. I see. Where... For if, if in the case he had initially gotten married to Teddy customarily mm -hmm. because of the nature of customary marriages and the principles that govern it then it is okay it because been, it is polygamous I see, I see. in nature ah, okay. so that is that is the but still regarding his case it is dependent because even customary marriage has its own prerequisites that would make it a customary marriage where the same has not been proved. Yeah. You see these days customary, we look at Kuchala, then we go mm -hmm. to Kwanjula, we go to Kuchale Wasenga, we go to Kwanjula, to the parents, then the mega, mega things that happen. The question is, just like us in Islam, we have the mahar and a consent of the parents, then also you as the bride, even in customary marriage, it's the same. So where the same is not proved, for example, payment of bride price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then. Oh, Muslims don't pay bride price. That, that bride, it's <laughs> Muslims pay, pay mahari. It's a gift from the man to the woman. Oh, I see. I so see. I will tell you that I want. <laughs> oh, I see. I and see. then you'll <laughs> give. So it's uh, <laughs> different words, same mm. thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. Uh, I want to understand sort of from like, I want to sort of understand you as the person. So when we are talking about this podcast and we are telling people to come to our podcast, we tell them we want to portray, the, we want to draw the portrait of the guest through conversation. Yeah. So I want to understand uh, the Muslim girl Asia, you know, from your <laughs> like roots. How do you come to be this uh, why, why do you take this legal path and you know how do you i know many people for example myself i i was raised catholic but yeah i'm not practicing you know how do you stay <laughs> with uh with your religion as well i, I sort of want to understand the story of you know asia <laughs> well asia is uh like you see i'm a muslim yes. and a proud muslim uh how i decide to take Let's start right. from school. You know. From school. Yeah, you can. <laughs> let's, let's do the whole autobiography thing. Autobiography. Yeah. Uh, well, school, post nursery, I was at Kampala Kindergarten, got through City Parent School, then Sablokagwa Primary School. Uh, then I thereafter I joined my secondary at Nabisunsa Girls School, uh, then University, at Islamic University in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Then after they are to the law development center, and now I yeah. So okay, advocate. quick question. Yes. yes. Uh, so the the before secondary, all those were city schools, right? Yes. 
and then you go to Navisonsa. Yes. Why why do you choose to go to uh that is IU IU? Islamic University in Uganda here at Kampala. Yeah, in Kampala. Why why do you decide to go to IU IU then? <laughs> Again, is it because of religion? No, actually. It 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 was not because of religion per se. Uh it's uh, as a family it's one of those even my elder brother went there. Oh, I see, I see. Um then also at the time we had um when we, by the time I finished senior six, I think McCary had introduced uh, low pre entry exams at ah. the at the university for bachelors. So I I did the ex- exam and I think I got forty eight or forty nine, and then the pass mark I think was fifty or so. Oh, I see, I see. So that's how I ended up at Islamic University uh, instead of pursuing any other yeah. course at McCary because I wanted law. I decided mm. to go to Islamic I see. University. And, and the question, the reason I ask is, I know the city schools shape you up to be more secular, you know, less religious, yes. more secular. Navi Sunsa is a, Navi Sunsa is a, is a religious school. It's, it's a, a Muslim-founded school. Oh, it's a Muslim school? Yes. Oh, okay. So, yeah, now that makes sense. I thought Navi Sunsa was a, a Catholic school for some reason. Oh, my God. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's uh, like it's a Muslim founder. Oh, okay, okay, mm. then that makes sense. Okay, so I thought Nabi Sunsa would also mold you to be. I know friends who went to Chibuli and they are less Actually, Muslim that there would be. Nabi Sunsa is a very liberal school mm-hmm. to an extent, and I think that's why you thought that yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. it's a Catholic school, maybe because the girls do not veil in their uniforms like the predominant Muslim mm-hmm. schools and how they do. It's, it's an all round school, it nurtures uh, the girl child to be you know, self-resilient, all-encompassed, and, and it's open for children, the uh, girl child for different religions, so. I see. Okay, okay. So, yeah, okay. Let's uh, <laughs> say Nabi Sunsa as a typical Ugandan secondary school, right? Uh, is it at IU, IU that you choose to to embrace Islam, or is it like from the family? Now, <laughs> uh, and again, the reason I'm asking is yes. I know many friends who, who are Muslim, right? But most of my friends who, who choose to take on the Islam identity, they don't, uh, rather, most of them who become successful by other means, you know, you become a lawyer like you, they usually don't take on that religious identity. You know, and it doesn't matter if you're Muslim or mm, not. Mm. Uh, I also went to a Catholic school for my secondary school. But, yeah, I thought the religion thing is for my parents, right? How, why, at what point, you know, is it because of university that you decide I need to embrace my religion as part of my identity as well? Well, no, I have grown up from a Muslim family. Both my parents are Muslim. And we, I have been nurtured into what I am today. The parentage that I got mm-hmm. right from when I was a child, that in as much as, for example, city parents, primary schools, those were not Muslim related uh, best schools, but uh, we would, you know, maybe in holidays go for darasas, go What's study that? the religion. Uh-huh. Those are darasas. Uh-huh. So because our religion, you, it's Arabic. When you recite the Quran in Arabic, you pray in Arabic. So would go and learn. You have to go and learn uh-huh. um, in different phases. So that is how, and even at home, that is how we were nurtured. You have to dress up like this and this yeah, and this yeah. but of course there, there is a certain point that reaches maybe a dollar sense and you feel like no this and this yeah. but it's 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 funny how as a person it is something that i i loved and embraced that there are times maybe you would leave home put on there you are like mm, no then you you this walk back home oh, this is, is not it? me yeah. because you feel that's not you yeah, yeah, yeah. See, see. so it is it is the nurturing it's not it's not like I, I it was a turning point at this point no 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 it is something that I started while I was still young I up see. to now. I see. Yeah. Uh, so the other question again is about law, right? So at uh, I'll tell you, for example, my story. When I did my Form 6, I flunked miserably. Yeah. But I was very lucky that uh, the time to join Makerere, MOOC had introduced a new course called Software Engineering, right? Mm-hmm. I, I wanted to be an electrical engineer. I thought that's what <laughs> people do, right? But when I, by the time I joined Makerere, I couldn't qualify for electrical engineering, but MOOC had introduced a new course mm, called software engineering. Yeah. Yes. So I applied and ended up sort of my, my life decided to take that course of becoming like a techie. 
but for you you know at, at and by the way uh, so they made a mistake on the list so i wasn't on the first list <laughs> For that but, software? Yeah, yeah. But I was ready to go and do BBA, which mm. was my second choice. I was like, for me at that point, it was my career that would choose for me what my life mm. would be, right? I'm wondering what made you resilient to know that, you know, I want to do law. What is it about law that even at, say, 18, by the time you join Moki at 18 years old, yeah, uh, at 18, you thought that is what you wanted to do? Well, my passion for law started way back in secondary school. I was a debater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was a debater right from when I joined secondary, I think, senior one, senior two. And um, uh, at the time, I think when I joined secondary, it was the, the, the modes of debate was, were quite unique from the usual that we knew of opposer and proposer. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were a unique and more challenging modes of debate that put you to, to task to analyze particular uh, topics and challenges in society and that was the the world schools debate format and the Cal Popper. So I think it was around my senior two or senior three, I can't oh, wow. recall, when I I was privileged to be part of the national team that I, I first went for training in Qatar Doha for our for the world schools debate format training. So I became a certified debate trainer under that format. Then in the subsequent year, I represented Uganda in the World Schools Debate Championships. Mm-hmm. Um, then I kept on, you know, being part of debate and building my skill slowly by slowly. But for me, my motivation was more on the, the, the kind and nature of debate because it was not about A is better than Z, but it was about what is the problem, what is the solution to your problem, and how is it better than the current uh, maybe resolutions, how are you going to change the status quo. Mm-hmm. And of course, while debating, you would look at challenges that people are facing in society. In a way or another, all of them are inclined to law, yeah, mm-hmm. because many of them involve policies, you have to change yeah. the laws, you have to change the policies, implementation strategies, and all that. So having that background, ideally, irrespective of having that background at an early age of senior two, I don't know why I thought I would do sciences and I would do additional <laughs> mathematics. You know when you feel so brilliant. Eh? Yet- <laughs> I read the worst mistake of my life yes. to do chemistry at so level. I did, I think, additional mathematics, thinking that I would do some PCB or PCM mm-hmm. somewhere. But for some reason, I ended up doing hell. <laughs> yes. So, law, really, the, 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 the background of debate nurtured my passion for law. Uh, more so, even when I joined A level and I started to do arts. Yeah, that, that, that I was. See. I see, um, I see. Um, Let's talk about the legal crisis since now. Let's get into debate mode and talk about the country's legal crisis, right? So one of the things, first of all, I thought most people who join law in Uganda want to become politicians. Then I realized it's mostly the journalists. Now I've realized it's even the musicians. Who want to become politicians. (laughs) But now let's talk about lawyers, right? So right now, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the story of the Kakwenza who was tortured and then the judge... Uh, refused to sort of give him his passport back, saying we can't prove that those you cannot prove that those torture marks were done by CMI, you know. Yeah. Uh, and this is like a big joke. Like if if uh, if I was say you know I'm an engineer, if I woke up one day and uh, I know for sure that one of Newton's laws is Newton's laws is wrong. Like engineering wouldn't make sense to me anymore. It would be a job. Yeah, but this is sort of the fundamental principle on which law is run mm. is uh, the judicial system. But right now, today, we see that uh, there is one old man who decides what the law is and that is what the law should be, right? How, where does that put you in your job? You know, like how does that make you feel to know that uh, sort of uh, most of what you're doing, for example, what you, what, you know, you're part of your uh, professional identity. Is a joke and rather not, not okay. So, sorry, that's not the right word. I'm, I'm trying to to to, to someone at some point, you know, like for example, and I'm very honest about this, right? Museveni or his son at some today, they can wake up and say, uh, 
what he's saying. For example, what he has been saying the whole time. We are not giving bail to people who are suspecting to be murderers, right? Mm. And this doesn't make any sense, right? But he can wake up and enforce that. He will pay if it requires paying the, that, that, that chief justice guy, whatever. You know, how does that make you feel as a lawyer that there are people who actually are in charge of this thing who are abusing it without any regard? Wow. Um, well, the issue of bail and the right from freedom of torture is something very controversial in Uganda today. Uh, more so the fact that it is one of the the, 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 the the things that is stipulated as paramount in the constitution of Uganda. Mm-hmm. So, and the constitution of Uganda being the supreme law of the land, not just any ordinary statute that you can amend at any point, because the amendment of the constitution has its own unique procedures under which it can be amended. Uh, Of course, the issue of bail has brought a lot of controversies, more so in the implementation of uh, even in the judicial system, bail applications. There are particular matters where you find that even the judges do not want to handle those particular matters, Mm -hmm. maybe because of the parties that are involved and the keen interest that particular stakeholders have in them. Yeah? Despite the fact that it is a a, a fundamental right, I am usually very preservative when I am making particular comments about... uh, particular Particular. stakeholders Mm -hmm. and I Mm -hmm. am encouraged um, (laughs) by your confidence when you actually go ahead and state names in the Uganda that we live in today. Uh, (laughs) But but um, yes, um, in law, I'll try to be Mm two-sided. Yeah. In Uganda, we have the presumption of innocence until until you're proven guilty. And that is the, 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 the basis of initially of bail, that by the time someone is arrested, taken to prison, they have not yet been tried and they are still presumed innocent because no evidence has been brought Mm -hmm. against them, yeah, beyond reasonable doubt that indeed they committed this offense. Then in in such circumstances, let this person be granted bail as he or she is being had in courts of law, uh, which per se makes, is, is, makes sense. Now, if I try to be a little balanced, of which I, I will look at the content and not the mode in which mm-hmm. the particular stakeholders are bringing up their point. We've had circumstances where uh, victims of particular crimes, for example, the, the crime is 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 done or implemented in an open space and everyone else has seen the act being mm-hmm. done yeah that the evidence is before everyone's eyes so in such circumstances this person is arrested and the presumption of innocence is actually put to the forefront yet irrespective of the fact that <coughs> This person has not yet been tried. Prima facie, on the face of it, everything seems as though, yeah. actually, everything is that this person has murdered mm. a particular person X. And I think that's where, that is the racial disdendal. You know, before we form, the laws are formed, yeah. that is the racial disdendal yeah. or the reason behind the wanting to scrap the bail. Because in such circumstances, someone like that, and by the way, bail, in, on grounds for bail, someone can be denied bail where it is not safe for him to be out on bail. Mm-hmm. Yeah? yeah, Where a court finds it that the moment you're released, actually the public will, <laughs> will gunner you down or yeah. even kill you. Yeah. yeah, So for me, my thinking is that that is, his, that is the picture that I'm painting on his side. Mm-hmm. The issue is how do you, is it an imposition? I am this and this, so you ought to do this. So no matter what, you have to do this. The challenge is that this is this is the fountain of honor. 
and this is an, a different organ of government. We have the judiciary and we have the executive. And we have separation of, that's when the issue of separation of powers comes in yeah. and how best checks and balances. And that's the challenge that the judiciary is facing right now. Yeah, One is the appointing authority. They are making an inference to a particular law on how they want it. And the other one is the implementing authority of the law. One is the one that passes the, the bill into the, <laughs> it to become an act. So for me, my opinion on that, still, first of all, I, 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 am, I, I am not in agreement with the issue of removal of bail, yeah, because it is a constitutional right. And in the event that that is to happen, let the right due process take its course, but still the, the, the rationale for it should be clearly stipulated and not necessarily a general scrap of bail. Because okay. there are those circumstances that will warrant, but at the same time it is at the discretion of the judge. That's what I would say so you would be yeah. taking away yeah. the discretion of the judge. If those circumstances that you're stating right now, let that be before the judge and mm. let the judge decide. Yeah. decide. So yeah, uh, and again, I, I think we, we agree. Uh, there's a joke on Twitter <laughs> that if you want to see who's powerful in this country, uh, see how they behave after they've broken the law. Right? Mm. Uh, there's a, is it called Kanyamunyo? I hope I don't. Mm. The guy who shot. Yes. Yeah. Ak Kena? Yeah, yeah, the one who shot. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah, he shot Aken, I think. And uh, last I heard about that case is apparently a traditional court in the North Sat. Okay. Now, the issue of the case of Kanyamunyo, um, of course, he was granted bail initially and i think during that period of bail that's when mm. the, the, the 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 two families tried to engage traditionally uh, i'll start with the law mm -hmm. <laughs> i'll start with the law the, the uh, our law accepts tradition yeah yeah as long as it is not um against human treatment or it is not degrading yeah. to human treatment yeah mm -hmm. and everyone has a right to belong to whichever culture or tribe that they belong now this is something that the two families decided mm -hmm. to do and but besides that initially Kanyamunyu had pleaded not guilty okay yeah him pleading not guilty intimating that actually he did not commit the offense. Mm -hmm. Entering into a reconciliation with the family um, and that whichever culture background that they have, they have a way, it's a culture thing that they do. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I may not be able to describe it, but at least I know I was in court that day when Justice Stefan Moviro was making that ruling. Um, afterwards, Kanyamunyo pleaded guilty Okay. Yeah. On plea of guilt, when you plead guilty, there are certain considerations, mm -hmm. yeah, that have to be considered. And then also, if you get time to get that ruling, that, that judgment of court, okay. you'll be able to, 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 to see the judge's reasoning. Of course, he tried to, to look at uh, similar cultures in different countries but then also he tried his level best to understand that activity that was done mm -hmm. it, it has its own there is a way they do it that side so he tried to analyze and look at the history of this activity its implication its what and all that now that activity alone does not necessarily remove the crime that was done mm -hmm. no but now they had to reconcile it with the law and the proceedings of court. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so where someone pleads guilty vis-a-vis -vis what was done, that is why many people would say, 
five, I think it was five years. I, I don't remember how many years he was dentist. Ideally, they would look at eh, killing someone vis-a-vis so here, here's <laughs> the, my the question, period right? of time. Okay, um, so you're the lawyer here. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm not wrong on this. Law is a capital f- uh, murder, murder is a capital, is a capital offense, offense, right? Kamunyamunyu was charged with murder, mm. right? Uh, it's also a criminal case. Yeah, it's not a civil case. So you, it's the state versus you. You know, if you kill someone, there is no family representative. It's not a civil case that some sort of someone in the family will come and represent. They can come and be witnesses, mm-hmm. but it is the state, right? Okay. We pay the DPP to come and prosecute you, mm-hmm. right? Mm. So Kanyamunyu did not have, like, I don't see room for negotiating with anyone else mm. apart from the state. Okay. Just like you have said, the, 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 the Akena's family... They are simply complainants, yeah? Mm-hmm. A, a yeah, criminal yeah. offense is against the state, yeah. yeah? But you're the witnesses. You, you the, complainants are the complainants are the ones that make the state's case. When you come to complain that so-and-so has killed my son, mm-hmm. yeah? You have to assist the state, you the complainant, yeah. irrespective of the independent investigations that could be carried out. A witness is needed in court to come and make certain averments that it happened like this or this and this or mm-hmm. this and this. Mm-hmm. So where certain instances where you see where the families maybe decide to negotiate, to a certain extent it might be detrimental to the prosecution case. Yeah. I'll try to delve more to another example and not necessarily okay. murder. Okay. Just like, and we've had these cases, yeah. In cases of defilement, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, or yeah. If, yes, in cases of defilement, yeah. we've had cases where a, ch- a child has been defiled, and then when they head to police, it is uh, the families that, that it is maybe the mother that will end up reporting, they will start on the process, and then the families decide to start to do what? To negotiate. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, apart from the medical report, which if state decides to insist to proceed with the case and other reports, police reports, whatever may be found at the scene of crime and all, some cases where the complainant or the victim himself Mm -hmm. decides to, you know, I I just want to let this go, you basically do not have a case to a certain extent. So So that is where, that's what I'm I'm telling you, that in as much as you say it is the state, the evidence, everything about law is about evidence. I, I totally, totally agree. Yeah, that is why mm. you will kill me with a panga, and I will say I did not, and you call it murder, and I'm like, no, I didn't kill him, I didn't commit murder. Mm. And then you have to go into the ingredients were you in the right state um, of mind? Yeah. Were you, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and that is the law. An yeah. ordinary person will not understand that, yeah. but the law <laughs> has those. No, I, I agree. So here, here are two things, right? And uh, we may jump from one thing to another a little bit, but here are two things, right? Overwhelming evidence, right? Mm. There was footage of this murder, mm. right? The parents or the the, the, the the northern traditional leaders, because most of them were like uh, tribe elders, who claimed to represent a kenna, mm. a parent to negotiate on behalf of the dead, were not there. They were not even the same district of this murder, Right? Uh, what, what do you mean they were not there at the scene or yeah at okay. the scene of the crime mm. not even the same district mm. they were ex- they were the farthest from from this scene of the crime right the person the victim is dead mm. right the victim is dead there is a suspect with video footage yes. of the act right the state takes up this burden again that is why we have a state that's why we pay tax right so the state can take on this burden to avenge people's death it's only the state that can kill legally (laughs) i mean if you if you think of it it's basically that is what that is right Mm. uh what happened in this case was legal trickery right first of all okay they got him to plead guilty Mm. which is one thing but what happened was inventing things that are unconstitutional to 
bring in uh, first of all jurisdiction that is out and, and again if what, i start using legal terms what that, jurisdiction you know, a traditional court mm-hmm. in a murder case mm-hmm. you Proceed. cannot bring uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that, 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 for me that didn't make any sense mm-hmm. right but again lawyers that's why i think you know the legal practice is a joke for people who want to be politicians mm. uh, please i don't get offended by this the, the reason for this is it doesn't make any sense at all for the state to leave a criminal case for the dpp here we should actually even to the dpp himself right for that for the whoever was supposed to prosecute that to leave the, a case like this out of uganda's legal system well the, the i can't i don't think the tradition it's not well yeah. <laughs> First of all, I I, 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 would say that it would be different if Kanyamunyu was acquitted on merely on the ground of that traditional engagement. That's what happened. No, I'm, I'm, I'm giving okay. an example. Yeah, please, please. You yeah. see, law is about strategy. Okay. Yeah, that is why you will have someone well knowing that the person killed. But how you organize and prepare your case mm-hmm. <laughs> makes you take the lead. And law is about proving. You who are ledgers, you must prove. Yeah. You have the burden of proof. Even when you come and indeed the person committed a particular crime, but you have failed to give evidence to that effect, then sorry, court will not determine in your favor because you have a duty to exactly. prove. Exactly. So where a court decides otherwise, it is not court. It is you, the litigant, that has failed to, to prove. prove. I see, I In see. this instant case, we are looking at... I, 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 I know that your concern is on the aspect of that whatever traditional culture that mm. was done. I think if in this, the inclusion, my concern mostly is that we have a traditional court. Mm. Uh, it's the same thing right now. If mm. I slap my wife, for example, mm. right? Uh, we'll sit with their family and my family and uh, we'll talk about this. This is very similar to what a traditional court is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. In a scenario, okay, I'm not saying slapping my wife is a minor thing, mm-hmm. but I'm saying in a scenario like that, that would be a reasonable thing to do, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want to overwhelm the court with any small, small, what? That's not a small, small thing, but maybe that would make use for traditional court. But in a case of murder. In a case of murder, where, like I have said, the mm-hmm. court did not independently use that activity to determine may either his acquittal. Mm-hmm. Like you, he pleaded guilty. Okay. And this is what I've said. These are strategies. Mm-hmm. You get on the drawing board and know how best do I help my client. I see. We've had scenarios where you go to court and indeed the evidence is overwhelming against your client. I would advise my client to plead guilty. Okay. And then I would come in and say, I will ask for mitigating factors for your sentence. And the first mitigating factor is the fact that you have pleaded guilty. The second mitigating factor is the fact that you have been in, in, in prison or on remand for a period of seven years, where maybe your maximum sentence was 10 years. All that period you have been inside mm-hmm. prison is counted because mm-hmm. you have already served yeah. it. Yeah. They will consider your, 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 your habits in prison, your personality, how have you been? What are those unique things that you've been doing in, in prison that probably have made you or other people better persons? What are those responsibilities that you have that would deem you as a responsible mm-hmm. man of society? That you have maybe children who are little, these children, because you have been in prison or on remand, they have not been going to school. You have, you know, and you're the sole breadwinner of your family you have some kind of um maybe terminal disease yeah and staying in prison for a very long period of time will not necessarily will not will be detrimental to your health so we we pray to court to give us a shorter sentence in this circumstance still the fact that i've said that the decision of court was not fully dependent on the traditional meeting 
what the traditional meeting helped, it was simply a mitigating, it was actually used as a mitigating factor mm -hmm. amongst other mitigating factors see, that I, I have see. stated I for I you. See, see, see. It would be different if, for example, he decided not to plead guilty, mm -hmm. he wants to defend his case, but he's negotiating traditionally the other side, but he's not pleading mm -hmm. guilty. Where prosecution has presented its evidence beyond reasonable doubt, even with those traditional meetings that they would have held, mm -hmm. and he's not pleading guilty, saying he's not guilty, and prosecution has presented all its evidence to show that this person committed this crime fully aware, then trust me, you, he would be convicted for whichever sentence that the judge may decide. I see. To so, take on. A quick question. Okay, I think I get what you mean, and I totally understand. Uh, and again, forgive my ignorance. I'm not a lawyer. So, <laughs> no, no, yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Uh, the thing also that I understand about law is there is a minimum sentence, right? So, for example, for murder, there is such a thing as this is the minimum sentence. You know, the judge cannot sentence you. Maximum sentence, not later than that. It depends on the phrasing, but proceed. Oh, wait, okay. So, no, first explain it to me again. My, most of my legal knowledge mm. is from movies, but <laughs> what I what I know is, if you if say you commit murder, right, you can't get probation. Uh, well, not probation. What's the what's the, you can't if you commit murder and if you plead guilty, say to first degree murder in the movies. I don't know if we have first degree murder in, in Uganda, but if you plead guilty to first degree murder in the movies, you cannot get uh what. Yeah, probation. You cannot just go and, and serve that of uh, community service, yeah. 30 days of community yes, service. Yes, yes. There is a minimum the judge has to consider. Right? The judge can give you life or death in states that allow death, right? Uh, but the judge cannot what? Cannot give you below a sentence that is below a certain minimum because that is stipulated. The punishment is stipulated in the penal code or whatever, one of those legal mm. articles. In this case, didn't what did Kanyimunyu plead guilty to and doesn't it have a minimum sentence um well we do have sentencing guidelines okay okay, okay. sentencing guidelines they clearly stipulate the the different offenses and mm -hmm. the, the what is considered what is considered to determine years or yeah. whichever sentencing that you might be given now, Kanyamunyu did not, Kanyamunyu, he pleaded manslaughter. He, it was not murder mm, per se. I see. But okay. like I have said, I yeah. when you look at the, 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 the condemnation that court got was the fact that those years seemed little compared to the act that Kanyamunyu mm, committed. Yeah, yeah. But like I've explained, we have to look at how long Kanyamunyu already was on remand, the number of years he was there, and all those different mm, factors. Yeah, yeah that I have stated. Yeah. And then also the, 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 the aspect of that reconciliation, it, I must say that it played a fundamental role to this as one of the, ideally, because when, when you look at that, my, my, my thinking is their intention for it was to forgive and let go mm -hmm. and life moves on, yeah? But the law is the law. You couldn't just yeah, exactly. go. Right. So in the event that the law is the law, you have pleaded guilty, we shall not follow your traditional, you know, how you handle it, that in such circumstances where such a, a, a traditional ceremony or reconciliation is done, the part is forgiven, you perform those traditional things, and it's a done case. No. We have our mainstream legal system. Yeah, mm -hmm. so in such circumstances, yes, instead of letting this boy go, because you can't plead guilty and then you just tell someone go. No, there, there is a consequence of pleading guilty. What only helps this person in terms of the sentence is that meeting the different see, mitigating see, factors. I see, I see. So um, I get where you're coming. There are maximum sentences, but they are all more like not later than period not later not mm. less no not less than a period not less than less than two years mm. three mm. years yeah, seven think, yeah. years that's like that and that is we have it in our penal code yeah and even our in in yes in our penal code so the sentencing guidelines determine that under mm. such and such circumstances you can sentence this period of time where the person shows this the, the different things that can mitigate then we also have 
those extenuating factors where some so the prosecution would show no there is no need to mitigate because this person is a serial offender this person did this this action in cold blood you would see all the intent you would the nature of weapon this person used you know that is now for the prosecution there's a tweet i i read a few days back right and this guy says uh, if you go to a, if you go to say uh, if you propose to to provide a service for public office yeah and you go and present your proposal and uh, display everything you'll be willing to offer and then the public officer tells you you're speaking too much english at that point it means they like what you're offering, but you're just not getting that they want you to do something extra mm. that is not, you know, that is sort of out of the scope. The, the, so the English you've spoken is too much about mm. this Kanyomonyo thing. Mm. Yeah? But if we go to that real Ugandan thing, how much of this is actually corruption, in your opinion? And how much of it is actually, you know, legal creativity? Like, okay, so there are two things. You can, there are two ways to look at this, right? Mm. In my opinion, this is corruption. The powerful people above the law in Uganda, mm. right? But one other way to look at it, this lawyer thought of something creative within the law that, you know, it was surprising that many people wouldn't have thought of. That's many strategy, other lawyers. Yeah, that's yeah exactly, right? Mm. So, as a lawyer, realistically, with not too much English, right? <laughs> Honestly, when you go back at home and you're sitting on your chair and you think about this case, how much of it is actual legal creativity and how much of it it's just plain corruption. <laughs> well, um, corruption, corruption, corruption. I see where you want me to go. Okay, we can move on. No, no, but I <laughs> no, don't want I, to I, go, I see where go, you want go. me to go. But um, whether corruption or not, mm. for me still, I will emphasize in 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 legal practice in as much as you don't want me to go into that legal is it is about your strategy it's about it's about your theory I see. your case is done on my drawing board that when you come and tell me the facts this, this every fact is important you will come and tell me yes i got the gun i shot him then i'll ask what before what you know i need to know before i need to know after i need to know to establish it's out of those facts that i can be able to get a single word or a single occurrence that is going to save you I see, I see. yeah so for me it is the theory and the strategy that was put down for corruption it could be there probably yeah it could be there but it's it's like a clean I don't want to use that. I, I, it's like a clean, how should I say it? A clean. No, you can use the Luganda word if it comes easier. Oh. Natural Luganda, <laughs> I'm trying to but, look for the word, but it is not something, it is something that would be it's inferred. Not exclusive, basically. Yeah, it is not something that can easily, it could be inferred, but it cannot be proved because uh. everything. Is, see, is clear on the plate, on the drawing board. I see, I see, I see, I see. I see. You get. Okay. So yeah. you're saying even if corruption was involved, the strategy was I'll, the more important part. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Still basing on corruption. Of course, there the, are the, the, the inferences of having corrupt judicial officers mm -hmm. where you have cases and it's about let the one with the most money yeah. take the most win. Most of the Ugandan cases, of, yes. for example. But... In such circumstances, you're not going to give that kin to Kidogo, yes? And then come and present a rubbish case. I see. Well, yeah, yeah. So, okay, that, that, I think, yeah. I, you get I what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Put up the fight. Put up the fight, yeah. Put up a good case. But when you're sure, you're making it easy for the person that yeah, she's doing. The, the, the. Because imagine a situation where both the prosecution and the defense or the, the, the plaintiff and the defendant's case, this is a battlefield. And they have equally put up a good case. Mm -hmm. So it, you should put up a case where it is hard for a decision to be made 
that in the event it is made, even when it is made in your favor, even when you gave something, it is justifiable. Yeah, okay. I, yeah, you you get right. what I'm saying? Uh, that, that is clear. That is clear. Basically, yes. law is more complex than I think yes. is what you're saying. But uh, let's move again to, uh, let's just briefly move to another murder case. Oh, murder cases. Uh, Segirinya and uh, what's the other guy? Sewanyana. Sewanyana, right? Sewanyana. Yeah. So these two guys get bail. Then they get kidnapped. And then the bail gets revoked. And the president comes to change the law. Right? It's... Uh, has he changed the law? He made I mean, he's changing that. the law. In the meantime, he's changing the law. What he's doing right now is changing the he law, right? He hasn't changed any law. So, <laughs> like for you, when you look at this scenario, right, doesn't this demoralize you as a legal practitioner to know like that the people who are out there who don't understand how much effort I put in, you know, mm. there are maybe four years in, in university, four or five years, and then another, uh, I don't know how many years at the law school at LDC, right? And then this guy comes and is like, ah, I don't like bail. You see my friends in the village, when they see the man that they, they saw killing, you know, giving those very, very uh, funny anecdotes. The man is funny, but... <laughs> the, the, you know, it's it's frustrating for me. I don't practice law, but it's frustrating because I feel like the country is being abused, mm. right? You, who's into this practice, what is your opinion? Well, I must say that I agree with you in that perspective because uh, to it does render the law negatory and of no of mm. no implication. Because at the end of the day, where you're fighting for justice, where you're fighting for the rights of those, yeah whose whose rights have been violated or you're trying to establish maybe innocence of someone and you have put up your case and you have all the evidence to show the same or you have all the evidence to refute the averment of the prosecution and then i wouldn't want to use the word from nowhere but i have used it uh the 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 the, the, the fountain of honor yeah makes uh, statements that actually would would cease those laws to exist and that is the example that i gave you the issue of separation of powers and the issue of checks and balances the challenge that we have in our legal system is that the appointing authority of these judicial officers is the executive. Mm. Yeah, I see. It's a big conflict of interest. So it is a very big conflict yeah. of interest where you're trying to safeguard a position for which you have been appointed, but yet at the same time, you have to fulfill and implement your statutory legal duties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm enjoying this conversation very much. So for me, I'm willing to go until you tell me okay, about the, <laughs> oh. the, the other thing that I wanted to 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 talk about, right? So you go to LDC. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's been a controversy, I think, late last year, about how LDC is promoting, how LDC is basically graduating people. Right. I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, some students claim they don't see their marks. Some students claim. Uh, the, yeah okay there's there's a lot of bit, there's controversy around whether people actually deserve to be on that graduation list or not right uh, and ldc is not transparent at all they try to be authoritarian which is sort of the ugandan go to method now of solving problems uh what what do you think about this controversy and you know do you have any suggestions that you think can make mm -hmm. the law what is ldc for law, law what the law development center law development center what what do you think you know can make it more transparent because again uh, sort of, if you think of the country as a session being, right? So if you think of, say, a dog as made of the heart and the lungs and whatnot, right? If you think of the, and the brain, right? If you think of the country as some similar, you know, sort of metaphorically as a session being, the law part is sort of, uh, I think, the combination of the heart and the brain of the country, right? Mm. It's very, very fundamental. Without the law, what we have is, you know, that anarchy thing of, Dog it dog. If you look at the law being abused, not just by the, the most powerful man in the country and his son, but also by the people who actually are supposed to train 
our legal guardians, right? Our judicial officers. If you look at abuse at those two extreme levels, you know, at the beginning and at the end, you know, aren't you worried that uh, we are inevitably going into a country where I decide what I want to follow? Okay. So the issue of LDC, um, I'll try to be more particular with maybe the incident that happened last year. Um, the center happened to have released a graduation list for students that had passed without releasing the marks. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that was the concern of students. And that sometimes the challenge that was first that there were situations where the graduation was conducted and done. And then at the time when the results actually came out, there were students that were not, that had failed mm -hmm. particular subjects. And all the students wanted were to verify their results exactly. at least before yeah. graduation. In that way, it would create some ample time so that they can be able to graduate with their colleagues. Of course, for me, this is an administrative system for the center. Uh, initial, and that's the first time this has happened. Is it? Okay, so I, I don't know, but from the conversation I had, it seems it was Uganda against LDC. Everyone was like, this is the worst institution in the country. This is the worst. Uh, <laughs> one, one of the other things, though, I think that uh, people were also frustrated with was the fact that they didn't have enough time to appear, the results. I think that's a thing at the LDC. I don't know. No, actually, yes. The, the, the issue of the uh, appeal, the challenge was this. LDC chose a graduation date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it has its own schedules. By this yeah, time, we yeah, have to yeah, graduate, yeah. yeah? Of course, I did not find it a wise decision or strategy for LDC to set a graduation date without first resolving exam issues. Exam issues. Or yeah. even if in the, in the premises that it had, there, there would or there ought to have been reasonable time that within this period of time, we would have been able to review mm -hmm. uh, the students' claims and concerns, then we can come up with a final graduation list. Of course, some of the students' results, some of the students' concerns were verified, but some of the verifications take a long process of time. It requires remarking where you're complaining that, for example, I was yeah. not marked, but or oh, as not marked mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. it requires getting LDC will give you uh, all those uh, procedural, you know, uh, technicalities. If it requires marking your paper, we have to pay the, the external examiner to come mark your paper. All oh, those are processes. So for them, they will tell you they will not hold their yeah. their, their calendar year, <laughs> yeah? yeah, for yeah. your. For your complaints. For your complaints. So for me, my, my advice, of course, like I have intimated, uh, students to be availed with their marks prior without necessarily setting up a graduation list before students knowing what their marks the are. Result, huh? Because that way it gives the opportunity to students actually verify their, 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 their marks or concerns or sometimes, you know, because LDC is a continuous assessment kind of system where we do exams or tests every week. The students mm -hmm. do tests every week. Those are the, 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 the IAs, what is the full word? <laughs> the, yeah. the, the assessments, so individual assessments, that's mm -hmm. IA. So you would find that maybe there's, there is a mark that is missing for a certain week individual assessment or there are marks for your individual assessment because they contribute a particular percentage. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the challenges. You would find students without IA marks, but they have the final results. They have the final results. They don't have final results, but okay. the IA marks are, are not there. So for me with LDC, my humble advice is that let the results always come out first. Let students be given ample time. Uh, of course, reasonable, not ample per se, mm -hmm. but results out, set time for verification, 
and then uh, they can and at the point of setting out setting up the first graduation list it's okay you can set it up but let there be time that after rectification you're able to make the final graduation list i see yeah. i see uh yeah so that uh i'm going to ask two questions before you conclude right uh, some guy there is telling me that i'm out of time uh <laughs> the first one is you've had my tone do you think i'm being unrealistically pessimistic about the state of this country or the future of this country that's one question i will first answer that then i'll, I'll ask <laughs> that um well I, I i wouldn't say you are pe- pessimistic but as a citizen as a young person in this country that has a vision or a sense or a particular sense of direction where you want Uganda to be as opposed to where we have been before mm-hmm. you have the right to demand because if there is any 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 prevailing status quo that you feel you're uncomfortable with then if you don't talk about it then nothing shall be done it's not until something is talked about after it's talked about then an action can be done about it and it is people like you actually you. that put the the, the 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 necessary stakeholders to task because when they are not questioned they will not be answerable no i agree i agree and uh, yeah thank you very much that's the right answer that i expected we'll cut it out as they clip to <laughs> to move this podcast uh so the, the the last question this we ask almost every guest we get uh and it's sort of okay i don't give a reason why we ask it but we ask <laughs> this every time we get a guest yes what is the legacy of us here you know what is that one thing you want to before which you've done you're not yet ready to retire you know or die or you know what is that one thing which if you do at some point in your life you'll be like yeah the mazeo i've done it all now hello so solo malayo because at whatever point i i i think mm. there is a phase there is a point where you reach like constant uka kuchino jakuba mazeo i'm a person who writes i, I journal a lot okay. so <laughs> that's why that question is hard I see, I see. because when i reach particular milestones i usually go back to my journal and tick mm. that one time i went back as like eh naika tv don't have a malayo where else should i but you know that's life um i wouldn't say that there is anything there is that there is anything in particular yeah. mm-hmm. that i would do that would make me feel satisfied but what my 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 ambition and my desire and my motivation is that i want to be in a society where what for whatever i do i see the effect and the positive effect sometimes it might be negative but for good to certain mm-hmm. people of the work of my hands and energy because it is very frustrating whenever you put in a lot and then you see no results so for me that is my motivation and ambition either professionally or spiritually or even in my personal life because no one can ever live to satisfaction but whichever milestone you reach let you be satisfied that for whatever you have done you're seeing the results that you intended to have I see. Yeah. Uh thank you. Yeah, I think this is a wrap. Thank you very much for accepting our invite. You're welcome. Yeah. This has been a very good conversation to have. It's uh very enlightening. I've learned a lot. <laughs> Now I'm going to go and pretend to know law. Ah, you certainly know law. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you guys. We can we can now wrap, wrap it up, I think.